Uh, so Mark is going to do a talk about um, his, I, I think the, the title of the talk was originally Python Everywhere. Yeah. But we've changed that now, so... I, I just thought up, like, Python Everywhere on the spot when Robin asked me to do a talk. <laughs> I quite like that. So anyway, so Mark is, is um, a, an awesome Python developer. He's been um, an entrepreneur as well. Um, uses Python in production everywhere, everywhere from the front end to the back end and everything in between. Um, and so, yeah, Mark's going to tell us about transitioning from C++ to Python and hopefully share a few anecdotes. And, um, yeah, hope you enjoy. Thanks, Mark. Cool. And his laptop is Linux and it works with a projector first time. So that's another... open office and plain old black and white. Um, okay, so my name's Mark, um, from C++ to Python. So a bit about myself, um, I've been a programmer professionally since 1999 and I originally started off doing uh, Visual Basic uh, 6 apps, desktop apps. Um, after about a year of doing that I moved on to doing Visual C++ but still in desktop apps. Um, and. Thinking back to, to those times, uh, the thing about Visual Basic 6 that I really liked was that if you wanted to build a program for the things it was good at, it was really good at it. You could like build a little form, put some buttons on it, you double click the button and it opens a little function where you just put in the code to do all the stuff. Uh, and I thought that was really easy and it was until you tried to get Visual Basic 6 to do something that it wasn't really good at and then it sucked and you had to go and use C++. Um, over my career, I've worked in all sorts of, as well as doing mostly those two, um, for about 15 years, I've done all sorts of like little oddball platforms here and there to do stuff for people. Um, all this stuff I got paid for, um, and uh, was an early adopter, I guess, of uh, mobile devices, doing stuff in the Palm OS from 1999. And it sort of um, uh, affects the way I approach some of these problems because I did all this stuff in all these different platforms like I don't necessarily have to like do things the same way as everybody else is. Okay so I worked for various different companies for about eight years and in October 2007 until May 2015 I started a company with a couple of other guys called Oscarpos. Um, Oscarpos does point of sale software, mostly for hospitality, but also in the sideline for grocery stores. Um, so it's basically touchscreen cash registers, um, and it's all Windows desktop software. So in, in a way, it's sort of embedded systems implemented as Windows desktops. Um, towards the end of my time at Oscarpos, um, we sort of saw that the internet was taking over the world, especially for like normal people. So. I decided to work on this thing called Delivery Engine, um, which was an app for our independently owned grocery store and fruit and veg store providers to be able to do e-commerce. Um, and as part of all of this, okay, so a lot of the other things that we worked on was um, the POS systems at the start. We were making really good money, actually, um, and over time there grew to be a lot of competition, so we decided that we needed to make everything cheaper. So at the hardware level, got rid of Windows and Android. Um, at the software level, I decided to change from C++ to Python, which is probably where we start to get into the meat of the talk. Um, basically, I saw that writing stuff in C++ was just taking too long. Um, the language is sort of really convoluted and complex, and then I need to compile things, and that takes ages. Um, Towards the end, it's getting to like 15 minutes to do a full compile of Oscar Pos. So uh, it's not a lot of fun when you've got to fix something urgently, press the compile button, and 15 minutes later, your software spits out. But we looked at all of this and said, well, okay, can we, okay, we'll get rid of uh, Windows and x86 go to ARM and Android, um, and then we'll get the hardware devices. Uh, can we run Python on them? Um, so luckily we can. I did a lot of searching on the internet, both for this question of, uh, well, what can we run Python on? Like, how can we get Python to run on something that's, like, a bit weird? Because it must be possible. They're all just computers. Um, you can, uh, like, C and C++ are officially supported for Android and for iPhone. So 
Python's written in C, so you should be able to run it somewhere. So there's a few projects out there, and uh, I found one called Kivi that was good that it had uh, cross-platform support for both iOS and Android, um, although I've only used it on Android. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do as well was to remove the need for the server. So in a lot of the POS applications, you need to like put the data in a central place in the store. Um, and uh, the problem with this is, again, we were trying to just make everything as cheap as possible. So I just tried to get rid of the server. And so I tried to work on some distributed database ideas that I'll touch on a little bit in this talk and probably talk in more detail at some later time. But so in terms of replacing C++ with Python, the second thing I did was uh, ask a question of like how or which languages will make me more efficient. So I did some research into which languages make me more efficient done a bit of C Sharp before, so I knew that I could get things done in C Sharp faster than C++. Did a bit of looking on the internet. There's actually one um, question on, I think, Stack Overflow, or maybe Programmer Stack Exchange, that sort of gave a sort of definitive answer that C++ compared to C Sharp or Java, they're twice as fast. If you compare Ruby, to Py Ruby and Python to C Sharp or Java, they're twice as fast again. So like that's four times as fast. So four times as fast for the programmer to get something done. Um, and uh, that sort of gels with my experience. Um, one of the first things I did, I'll just finish this one up. One of the first things I did it, doing Python is I decided to, we had this little separate component for OscarPos that could be written as a separate program. So I wrote it as a separate Python desktop program in PySide and it took me two days to figure it out, which it would have taken at least a week in C++. So I thought the four to one ratio of program efficiency was pretty good. A um, couple of other weird things we got asked by the, the users. Um, so the users of restaurants are all small businesses and they say, well, the, some of them, they want remote access to the terminals, but they don't want the cloud. Um, so I came up with an idea to put the, keep the user data in the store, but give them remote access. Um, in C++ world, we've done this with v uh, OpenVPN and installing software on the, the, their like, own Windows laptops. Um, but wanted something a bit more lightweight. So one of the things you can do um, that is really good if you use Twisted is to write a proxy server. So the store data lives in the store. There's a proxy server in the cloud. End user on the internet connects to the proxy server. The store is always connected to the proxy server if it's on the internet. Connect to the proxy server. Proxy server asks the store for the data. Store sends the data back to the proxy server and it sends to the user. Because it's all asynchronous, it's all really easy to write. You just get the request from one end, send it to the other, wait for it to come back. When it comes back, it's an easy function to send it around. So real easy. That was another one that was like, that would have been a quagmire in C++ to do, especially with threads. Okay, another reason was context switches. So context switches are expensive, as we know from our code. Uh, but context switches are also expensive for humans. Um, a standard like startup stack, especially if you're going to have both web and mobile, might look like this. So you would have Django for your back-end web development. I hate need someone to do HTML uh, to do like static web pages, JavaScript to make it dynamic, uh, C++ to make the HTML pretty, SQL to query the database, Swift for your iOS application and Java for your Android application, which is seven different things. So I didn't want to have to learn seven different things. Um, and at a previous company I'd worked for doing C++, uh, we had um, we had a, like a lot of different stuff, and we had C++ clients and servers, but everybody could do everything. Um, and the only time they screwed that up was that they everybody was busy. So they got one of the tech support guys to write this configuration utility in Access and Visual Basic. Um, and I was basically hired to write the replacement of that access and this basic thing in C++. So everything was together, anyone could work on anything. And I thought that was just a much better way to organize a company, especially when you're small and you don't want to have to like do one thing and then change to something else or hire like lots of different freelancers who can do different things and then they just like work for you once for two weeks and then they disappear and you've got to try and fix it when it goes wrong. Okay, so language that's fast to develop. Uh, so I settled up on an architecture of using Twisted, PYJS, and Kivi. Um, one of the cool things about Kivi and Twisted is you can actually run them together. 
So you, there's a special reactor where you can get the Kivi event loop and the Twisted uh, event loop together. Um, and that means that uh, you can do on a uh, Android tablet stuff that you can do on a normal PC and just run it as a web server or in in my case it mostly works as a client but it can be made to work as a web server uh, in special cases because uh, it's just a computer but most people don't think well I'll never need to run a web server on an Android device. Okay, but probably uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of today is PYJS. So PYJS is the front end that runs inside the web browser. Um, what PYJS is a port of a product from uh, Google called GWT. So GWT was a um, Java to JavaScript compiler that meant that you could write front end web apps the same way as you could write desktop Java apps. And PYJS is a Python port, GWT. Um, and another way in which it sort of shows that Python is a better language is that PYJS is about 8,000 lines of code and GWT is about 200,000 lines of code. Um, although apparently GWT has... There's a bit of a point of contention that some people... Go away. Some people say that um, GWT does more stuff because it has all this internationalization stuff, but some of the stuff I've read is that PYJS doesn't actually need it. Um, what it is internally is a Python to JavaScript translator, so it'll try and find your Python code and translate it into JavaScript. Um, and then it's a library that will make web apps in the same way as you made desktop apps. So when you make desktop apps, um, especially sort of in the, in the Java style, is that you'll just add controls dynamically to different bits of the screen. Um, and you don't use like a markup language like HTML. And it was sort of done to help. I guess in a way GWT was done to help uh, desktop app developers get used to writing um, web apps. So front end is a program written in Python. Um, and the way you implement this is you compile it to JavaScript and then you just point the web server at the appropriate JavaScript files, point the browser at it, and off you go. Um, the way I do it, so you can do it, you can pretty much get it to do anything you like. It's just a compiler and a library. You're not locked into any particular approach. But the way I do it is I start it up, uh, connect back to another web service running on the web server, and download everything you want. So it's, it's a bit like have, so you just like have your program running talking to a web service, getting the data at once, and drawing the UI programmatically. Right, how do we get the data down? So the way I've implemented this is um, you just make a post. Uh, originally I was gonna do a get because I thought I'd make it like restful, but it didn't actually seem to really match the model of what I was doing do a post um, and ask for something. So because this is like point of sale or e-commerce applications, the most important thing that we're asking for is the product list. So it says, give me the product list. It gives the product list back. The product list is in all the various classes in Python for the different things that do different bits of stuff. Um, basically, I just turn everything into a dict and then return a list of dicts. Um, and the dicks or the classes themselves can have other things that belong to them, like a product might have barcodes, so it has a list of barcodes, turns it all into dicks and lists, and then turns dicks and lists into JSON, ships it to the other side, and then reassembles it. So this is what it sort of looks like in its own native format. We have a product. Uh, my product might be a pizza. It costs $13.50. What's hash equals? I've never seen that before. Oh, it's a comment. Oh. It's a comment. Oh, okay. Because it's $13.50. And I presume that's to because stop rounding? Errors. Yes. You don't want your prices to be in floats because that does bad things. Yeah, I made that mistake. And uh, so in my C++ code, I have a lovely function called approximately equals. Well, you should use decimal then, right? I was thinking that. The yeah. decimal class. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 If you're not careful, you end up with the uh, situation that was in the Office Space movie that the screenshot earlier was yeah. wrong. Yeah. Have you seen the movie? No. no. Oh, okay. Well, it steals a plot from Superman 3, stealing money in cents of time. Yeah. Which is 
true with that. It could happen if you have floats as your prices. Yes, although it is... Um, in one part of Oscar Pods, it actually... It is sometimes valid to calculate prices in fractions of cents. As long as you don't, the customer gets charged a nice round amount. So, especially when suppliers do deals for customers and they're really odd deals, like, oh, if you have, like, three for $20, and, okay, so maybe it's normally... What's a good thing? Normally, if it was normally $8 each, and supplier said, oh, you can have three for $20. So $8 each product, like, 800 cents, easy enough. But at $20, it's a fraction of a cent. So I had to deal with that as well. Um, so I might not keep it at that level. And it might need to have its own price class that allows you to round off to hundreds of cents or something like that. Okay, so you basically just turn it into a dict and then into JSON. And in this case, it seems that the JSON and the Python were actually exactly the same code, um, which surprised me a little bit. I was sure they were different. Um, so that's really cool, but also you might notice that the ID is a UUID. So I mentioned about doing distributed databases because we want to account for the situations where our machines might be disconnected or something like that. So one of the things you have to do in distributed databases is your primary keys always have to be UUIDs because if they're just integers, they'll collide. Uh, what else? Oh, okay, so this is one that, question that Robin asked me a couple of weeks ago. Um, how can you work without having jQuery or without having a JavaScript framework? So the answer is because you build your... Um, and this is a common question, right, because everybody's so used to you produce HTML and then we'll have some JavaScript like sort of animate it and then we'll go from there. So how do you do that? You need jQuery to do that efficiently. Um, so the answer is that basically you don't need it if you draw every, if you create your UI programmatically because you can just assign things to um, what they call collections as you go. So if you want a collection of like all the buttons of a certain type that you're going to animate, you can just build them into a list and then every second if you want to animate them, just go and animate them. Um, another one is... Uh, so another framework I looked into was AngularJS, but AngularJS sort of, to my opinion, took that to like an even more sort of crazy level that you tag HTML with special tags that then the JavaScript sort of knows something about and it just seems crazy. Like, I'll just build my UI and just arrange it however I want. And one of the problems you get into with frameworks like Angular is then you have to write your program in the way they want it to be written rather than if you use something like PYJS where it's just a language and a library you can use any development methodology you like right? or even no development methodology just hack it together ah, right so this is what some of the code looks like um, this is what gets called when we uh, in delivery engine when the user searches for a product So when the user uh, searches or selects a product, uh, or sorry, or a group, comes back with a list of stuff to fill in. The way the structure works is that a group can contain products or subgroups, and then the subgroups can contain further products or subgroups. Uh, vPanel2 is just where we're putting it. So I wrote my own function to clear it all out. That's just like part of my utilities. Uh, L is a list of stuff. If it's a product, create the button, uh, give it the right name. Uh, link it to the product object, link it to a click handler, set the width, add it to the button, add, sorry, add it to V panel, and so on. Similarly for the group, except put the object in a different place and uh, set the click handler to a different one. Um, also the style name, so I just use Bootstrap, so there's a way of connecting PYJS up to Bootstrap, so you can just use all the Bootstrap styles, which made it quite good because my uh, artistic talents are pretty limited so I could just use that um, personally this like seems logical to me that this is how you should build your UI um, rather than uh, in a sort of more normal web framework you would call a function in Python to generate some data to query a database or something then 
use a templating language to make HTML, then that HTML links to CSS and JavaScript and you send it off to the web browser to figure it all out. Particularly, I find that the template is just really ugly. Like HTML is just an ugly language to me. And the templating languages, like the Django templating languages, and I've also used Mako, um, they try to be a bit like Python, but they're still ugly bits of semi-Python squeezed into HTML and I have to sort of carefully look around and where are the tags in the templating language ending and all of this. And I just think this is much easier to understand. Like I can just look at this and understand what it's actually doing. Oh, I've nearly finished. Okay, um, distributed databases. So I'll just talk a little bit about this. Um, I was going to go into more detail at some other time. Um, so what the, the problem we were having at Oscar Poz is if we want to reduce the costs, we want to get rid of as much fixed stuff as we want and we want to use as many cheap computers to implement the system as we want. So we get rid of the central server and we also want to get rid of network cables because it costs like hundreds of dollars, sometimes thousands of dollars to cable up a place. Why can't we just use Wi-Fi? Um, and if you go and talk to like restaurant owners and they say, well, why can't I just use Wi-Fi? It works okay at home, or even if they have like customer Wi-Fi in their premises, it works okay. Um, so the reason why you can't is if your POS application that's critical business infrastructure is always polling the server, um, it needs a reliable connection. And in Oscopos and in all of our competing products, if like a cable goes, that's it, the terminal's totally dead. And even if it's an intermittent failure, that's it, the terminal's pretty dead, it pretty much crashes. Um, so in Wi-Fi, there's radio interference. And in a restaurant, it can be particularly bad because uh, microwave ovens can spew out radio interference if they get rusty. Um, so on your home machine, or on your customer surfing the web, they wouldn't even notice there was anything wrong with the Wi-Fi, or they might just notice like a second glitch. But your POS terminal could well fall over on a second glitch. So we have to deal with unreliable connections. We have to deal with possibly slow connections because in um, radio interference might be at a lower level where something can get by. So basically, um, I was working on some ideas to do databases a bit like how Git does code. So you just record changes. Um, so I might have two terminals in a restaurant. If you imagine there's two waiters taking orders for a table, uh, one takes a cappuccino, one takes a flat white, and they both want to send them through. A normal POS system would lock the table, like it would just work like database applications that we're all sort of familiar with, but you get a record, you open the record for editing, you lock the record so no one else can change it and stomp all over you, and then you can't do it. But in reality, if humans were doing this, and they do in a lot of restaurants, they know what to do. They can see that someone, you know, there was one cappuccino, one flat white, and they should have both gone to the table. So I was working on ways that the computer could actually do the same thing, which is basically to treat the database like Git, treat source code, and just record all the changes that are made, and merge them all together at the end. The negatives of PYJS. Uh, so it's not all like really cool. It does have a few issues. The biggest issue is that it's not actually 100% Python. Um, so, and it will never be 100% Python because there's some things that will never be implemented. And the, the first one that jumps to mind is eval because it doesn't actually bring a copy of the Python interpreter with it. So how can it just evaluate your code? Um, and what it actually does is it just calls a JavaScript eval, but it's all a bit strange. Um, there's stuff in the standard library that's not implemented as well. Um, the next problem it has is that it's old, and it was started in 2008, and it emulates Python 2, and it doesn't do try and emulate Python 3. And uh, I'd love to have Python 3 so that other bits can be in Python 3, but uh, no such luck at the moment. It's not been very well maintained for years, and it was missing stuff, uh, in particular my favourite default dict, which I basically had to implement myself. Um, and in reality, it's a Python-like language. But 
and there is one positive sort of aspect to that is that if I flip it around and I write my code in PYJS, then that'll work as Python. So I haven't found anything that's where the opposite is true. So if I write some PYJS, that it doesn't work as normal Python. So the way that I've been working on Delivery Engine um, is that the, the front end that I concentrate on is the web browser, and all the unit tests run in the browser, um, and then they call into the server component to do whatever they need to do to reset the database or whatever, so that everything is tested and gone working in PYJS first, and then in Python, I'm pretty confident it's going to work. Uh, cool. So, what next? Um, so what's next for me? Um, I'm going to keep working on this uh, distributed database technology um, and keep working on the Delivery Engine app to... The Delivery Engine app doesn't actually use a distributed database tech at the moment, so I want to have everything in one place. Um, one thing that's quite coming along that's quite cool for this is JSON query and storage in the database. So late last year, SQLite um, finally shipped native support for JSON queries. So you can just store JSON data in SQLite instead of um, tables. And uh, Postgres has had this for about a year and a half. Um, so I'm probably going to be like, while I've sort of got time, and I'm not really working, like Delivery Engine doesn't need to ship anytime soon in like six months, it'll be fine. Try and get all of this in so I have all this sort of newfangled tech running in my app for when it's needed. Um, so the app's about 90% done, um, but I'll probably just like do more than 90%, like just go over the top. Cool, and we've got some source code and a live demo. So if you want to go and have a look, because this uses distributed database technology, uh, multiple people should be able to edit this, but I just wrote a little graphics program in PYJS, to, and the source code was available. Um, I'll put the URL up later or in the meetup group. That's how it works. You can have a go. It might even work. It might not crash. It might crash. Um, one of the reasons to do this is because like graphics apps aren't very often done in the front end of web apps. Um, and uh, also, uh, doing a drawing program or a painting program like this is actually a common sort of hard example for a desktop app, where you have to do things like put graphics on the screen and respond to the mouse and pick up the... So you can pick up the little things. Oh, hey, it's me. Adding stuff. <laughs> cool. He's adding lots of stuff. <laughs> You're just adding more and more triangles, like just bashing, uh, bashing Stop at it. ruining his demo. Sorry. No, 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 keep going. This is the idea. What I, what I just don't want is, <laughs> what will ruin the demo is if you crash the server. <laughs> that was too complex. That's version two. Or somebody, somebody could like contribute a change to it on GitHub to like add more shapes if you want. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty much all I've got to say about changing from C++ to Python and talking about what I've been doing and, and talking about PYJS and why I think it's an awesome platform. Um, cool. Awesome. Does anyone want to ask any questions? Or? Absolutely. What year did you switch over to Python? Um, in 2014. So I actually decided in 2011 that basically for my sort of future employment prospects that I needed to be able to do more stuff. Um, and I started to work, actually, sorry, I started to work on a few little things in Oscopos, like the, the kitchen display app that I talked about and a few little utilities for us. Because if we needed a separate app, I could do it all in Python, but if I needed to add something to the old Oscopos app, I could only do it in C++. But in 2014, I basically decided all new code is gonna be in Python and I'm writing totally new apps from scratch. This isn't your production server, by the way, is it? Uh, this is... I have no production server. Oh, good. I, okay. I only have demo apps at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if you could go back to the first day that you started doing Python, 
what yep. would be the lesson that you wish your future self could have told you when you were first starting out? Um, actually, probably um, to get involved in the community and and come along to stuff. Uh, not just because I'm here, but um, and, and trying to like butter up the organisers or anything. Um, Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Cool. Now we're getting well, something. It works on this phone, and that's saving something. Okay. It's not. It's not optimized for mobile, or even supposed to even work on mobile. This uh, is. This is two point three Android two point three. Okay. So I am very impressed. Okay. Cool. Um, it'll also work uh, in IE six because because wow. PYJS is such an old platform. It had compatibility with IE six. Um, that is insane. Yeah. I, I I started to come along to like startup community events in two thousand. Uh, I came to one in 2013 and then started to come in 2014 regularly and I got a lot of value out of it and I wish I'd like done it five, seven, eight years earlier, although I don't think there were any events in 2007 to come to, so that would have been the downside. So uh, actually I probably started coming to them pretty much when they started happening. You could have started it eight years ago. I could have, but I didn't know that I wanted to start it. <laughs> no, right? no, yeah, start yeah, it. that was the thing, I didn't know what I needed to know. Yeah. Um, this is more of a group question. Of the people who've learned Python, who's done it through the book, like say through Bob Buffins, and who's done it through a video tutorial, and who's done it through like just reading on the website? Video tutorials. Video Does anyone still use Buffins? Buffins? Well, that's a good one. Oh, oh yeah. that, uh, I went in today just to see how much was dedicated to Python, and that was a bottom shelf. Which is quite a lot compared to Android and iPhone. Android and iPhone have equivalent amount of space together. So it's just interesting. I, I, I always learn new tech with the book, um, although I'll buy online now rather than from Boffins, but just because I feel that. Um, I spend a lot of time in front of a TV, uh, so a computer screen anyway, so if I'd like to sit down and read something. Okay. Get so what's the, is it. Is it um, I didn't learn from the book, so is it like an O'Reilly book? Yeah, I got the O'Reilly book. Okay. That's pretty much all you need. The O'Reilly book for whatever you want to know. <laughs> what do people think? Sorry, what do people think is the best book to learn Python? Somebody was asking me about you know, teaching them Python, but I don't know what's the best book to recommend them. Well, sorry, but that depends on how they're learning mentally. Yeah, if sure. they are visual or not, they are more like audio and it's really important. It is tough to say. For me, I. I Especially in C++ and Java, we want to have a lot of examples. Go through each of the books while you're in the store and find out what examples closest to what you want to do. Um, that's the quickest way. I mean, that's the, that's where I found out. Well, I wanted to create you know, web applications. So, I know, in Python, the, the biggest framework is Django. So I just learned it through the tutorials. They have really good tutorials. Mm -hmm. So I basically learned Python through Django. And yeah, basically, if you're learning Django, you're already learning Python. So I would say that would be a good way to get started. You get immediate feedback because you're building a web application and things appear on your browser. So I think that would be a good way to get started with uh, Python yeah, through Django. I was like the I point people towards Code Academy um, for the like the very beginner sort of level stuff. Is that the Canyon one? Is Sorry. Are you talking about the Canyon one where you can buy like, scripts and things like that? Academy. Code Academy, yes. So Code Academy is like so it's just like an interactive Python tutorial. Yeah. yeah I um, did that recently. I've got a question mark. So yeah. can you go back to your slide where you have some pi like probably the, the one with the most code on it? There's only one with code on it. Oh, okay. So it must be that one. Can you go back to the one with code? This one that that one there, yeah. So I was just wondering, so this is um, PyJS, right? So that when you compile this, is it just going to be essentially the front-end JavaScript that it creates? So um, there's no back-end interaction? There's no back-end necessarily. You don't have to have so a back-end in PyJS. It's yeah. transpilation versus compilation. Yes. So it's, it's a transpiler. So it will literally take that yeah. and try and turn it into JavaScript code. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. So yeah. this this is sort of like your front end code here. Yeah. And so this this doesn't include this this particular slide doesn't have any back end interaction. No. Right. No. No. Just a quick question: Is it some sort of implementation detail as to why you're using get attribute there? Yes. 
okay. because JavaScript doesn't have any equivalent. Um, if you attach a, apparently if you attach a function to an object in JavaScript, then there's some complexity to get it back that you have to use get attribute. Is it uh, because of the scope that's going to be executed in? I can't actually remember what the reason is. Because usually if you're going to do something like that, you have to, quite often you have to explicitly bind a function to a particular scope if you want the this yeah. to point to the correct object. Yes, I'm not sure. I'm this not is sure. Okay. Yeah. Is, yeah. is the button class something that was already provided, or is that something you created? Uh, the button class is already provided by the framework, yeah. All right. So basically, you're building it. This, instead of writing HTML, you're writing yeah. Um, yeah. Python. And it will yeah. make a HTML button behind the scenes. So how much? Um, so it's basically your front end written in, you've got some HTML, and you've got some PyJS? You only have enough HTML to bootstrap it. Oh, okay. And so you basically, I have a blank, uh, I have a splash screen that okay. it shows while it's downloading all the all the JavaScript. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, and then PyJS kicks in. Yeah, yeah, does it? Okay. Could you talk a little bit? I mean, I, I I know a bit more about what's going on in your back end, but can you talk talk a little <laughs> bit more about um, why you chose chose um, tornado? Is it twisted. tornado? Twisted. Twisted. Why you, cho twisted. Why you chose twisted? Twisted. Because I went on the uh, because I wanted to do oh okay so um, in uh, so a standard web server like Apache is a program that calls into your program and that's cool if you've got a Linux server um, but I knew I wanted to do like strange and unusual things where I would actually have the server be an on-premise piece of equipment yeah. um, and I wanted to write everything in Python if I could because I know users would just like fuck stuff up like configuration files um, and also. Uh, when I was talking about like knowing, having to know lots of different languages, the configuration files for like add-ons or other service services that your app calls are also another language you have to know. And this is another place where security problems come from because stuff is not configured correctly because like you just have to know too many different things. Um, so basically, I looked on the web to see, well, is there a production-grade web server written in Python? Because there's a little example server in the library that I was toying about with. I thought, well, it would just be really cool. And so Twisted came to the top of the web search. I looked at it. It could do everything I wanted. I could plug in to Kivi so it could run on the Android device. And, yeah? Cool. So, on, so you've got essentially Twisted running um, with Kivi on the Android device yeah. and then Twisted running on the web server. Yeah, just running in Linux. Cool. Yeah. Is that going to be your setup for delivery engine? Twisted? Delivery engine, Twisted is going to be. Delivery engine, I've put apps on hold and just going to do a web page. Mm. So that's why I'm talking all about PYJS because I'm not doing any Kivi Android work at the moment. All right. So uh, you still can do it in Twisted, right? You still can yeah. post down Twisted and you're going to do, you're going to do that? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, all, it's all going to use Twisted as the web server. Have you looked at any other Python to JavaScript tools out there, like, like um, Transcript, Python scripts, Python? Um, I've yes, looked. Um, Brython is a bit too new. Um, it's the oldest. <laughs> okay, I've heard. I've heard it's. It seemed a bit new to me. Um, maybe it's just the order in which I found this because I originally started looking in two thousand and eleven. Okay. Um, and then yeah, uh, some people have said that it's slow, and Brython did look appealing because it's Python three. Um, so I have considered changing but also Brython from what I can remember doesn't have the equivalent of like the desktop like UI you, it works more like a normal JavaScript application works um, but yeah I was thinking to look at it because then it would give me Python 3 but my personal priorities were more I'd like really like to ship a product soon and this will get me a product so you, one of the things you want to do is avoid the HTML? yeah 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 Yes. Distributed sure. database. Well, what are you doing about that? Can you talk a bit more about this? I'm, I'm writing a back-end library, um, which uh, if you look at the source code in GitHub, it's what's, what is in there is in there. Um, so yeah, I'm basically writing a back-end library that both of those apps would eventually use. Uh, um, and so, well, your own database, it's not post. Uh, no, it'll it'll sit on top of um, either SQLite or Postgres, which is why I mentioned that it's a big advantage to me that now they both support native JSON queries because you don't have to worry about database schemas. 
mm. because database yeah. schema is a big pain in the ass and database mi schema migration is a big pain in the ass and I've been wrestling with it like for uh, like weeks in Django. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, well, we can keep uh, talking and networking here till about, um, till about 8 o'clock, but can you please uh, join me in thanking Mark for his talk? Thank you.